We do come to a point of transition in the book of 1 Samuel now. Now what we're going to see this evening in 1 Samuel chapter 9, and God willing as well as 1 Samuel chapter 10, we're going to see if we can't do two at once, is the anointing of King Saul, thus beginning the time of the kings of Israel. J.R.R. Tolkien once said, A king will have his way in his own hall, be it folly or wisdom. And I'm not so sure there's ever been a king that that is quite as true about than King Saul. He had a whole lot in regard to his impact of the Old Testament and his position in the book of Samuel. Every chapter we're going to look at from now to the end of what we call 1 Samuel, by the way, in the Jewish understandings of the way Scripture is organized, there's just the book of Samuel, not 1 and 2 Samuel. But what we call 1 Samuel is going to revolve around the rest of, uh, the rest of its pages are going to revolve around King Saul. And eventually David's going to come into the picture, but he's going to be a prominent figure from now on in the rest of this book. And what is fascinating is he had more emotional instability than you can really even put into words. On one hand, Saul was a courageous and strong king. On the other hand, he could be a tad off. What do I mean? When he was called, if you actually read 1 Samuel 9 and 10, when it was time for him to be publicly shown as king, he was hiding, even after he had already been anointed. He's kind of an interesting guy. But as I said, he's going to be a prominent person in the rest of 1 Samuel. He's going to be used by God to fight Israel's enemies, the Philistines. He's also going to be used by God to prepare the land for the reign who, for the one who comes after him, the true king of the tribe of Judah, David. But this evening, we're going to look into the calling and character of Saul, and it will, one, serve as a prerequisite for your understanding of the rest of this book, but it's also, I think, going to contain a lot of applicable lessons and uh, takeaways for our situations today. But so, he called himself a very, very un unimportant. At first. Uh, and it's we, remarkable how things change, we, isn't it? Um, but I'm going to try and expound for you four takeaways of this text and exposit four truths that we can learn from this text. I want you to see, firstly, God's pick for the new king. And look at verse 1 of chapter 9. God's pick. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bechoroth, son of Ephiah, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, or Shaul. A handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now, there's a lot of things you can learn from those two verses. For one thing, Saul came from a wealthy family. It says that his, man, his father was a man of wealth. Now, later in this chapter, as Uncle Dillard is alluding to, in verse 21, Saul is going to be a little humble. He says, am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? But as modest as he may sound in that verse, I don't think Saul was coming from a place of poverty. Uh, verse 1 says that his father was a man of wealth, his father Kish. The Hebrew term there for wealth can also be translated as army or power. That's why the old King James says that Kish was a man of, a, a mighty man of power. The Holman Christian Standard Bible actually says that he was a man of influence or an influential man. The uh, New American Standard says that he was a mighty and valiant man. But you put all that together and you understand Saul didn't come from the humblest of origins. Uh, he was by no means poor. And sometimes you do have politicians and political leaders in our world this, these days, as perhaps with all time, who wield a lot of authority, have a lot of wealth, but they present themselves as, you know, just like you and me. Does that get on your nerves? It infuriates me. Um, we were at uh, school a couple of years ago. We had one of our senators, state senators, uh, no, excuse me, national senators. We had Cassidy come to uh, school, and Cassidy, uh, Senator Bill Cassidy, was given a presentation about how he was hoping to lobby for more and, qu and faster internet in our parish. And uh, he presented himself to these students at what is effectually an inner school as if he was an everyman and truly understood where they were coming from. Meanwhile, wearing a suit that costs probably more than my truck uh, and arriving in a private vehicle with armed guards and, you know, everything else, you know, senators get to have these days. 
Politicians have this nasty way about them of presenting themselves as anything less than what they are. But I will say that Saul was nothing less than, I believe, wealthy. Not only a wealthy family, he also comes from what you might be able to garner as a worldly family. A worldly family. Track with me on this one. It might sound weird, but I think we can draw this conclusion. Latter, the latter verses in this chapter illustrate and indicate Saul didn't know who the prophet Samuel was. Which is remarkable, because where Saul was from was a place called Gibeah. And Gibeah is only five miles from Ramah, which is where Samuel's primary dwelling was. Now Samuel did go on a tour, a circuit tour of judging Israel, as we saw last week, but his primary crib was in Ramah. And Saul had no idea who he was. And a lot of people, a lot of scholars have been able to extrapolate out from that that apparently Saul's family didn't have as much involvement or engagement in terms of their faith. That is, going you know, yearly to offer sacrifice or knowing that Samuel is the leader both politically and religiously of Israel. He has no idea who he is. And what's more, Saul's land where he was from in the tribe of Benjamin, do you know what tribe is adjacent to Benjamin in the land grants? Judah. He still didn't know who Saul, uh, Samuel was. Now, of course, Samuel wasn't of the tribe of Judah, I don't believe, but it is to say that the true king would come from Judah, and Saul didn't really know that. And later, as we see in this text, he goes on a scavenger hunt to find some missing donkeys, and he gets to this town where Samuel is, and this woman tells him as much that the seer, the prophet Samuel is here, and Saul is under the apparent ignorance of who that is don't know. Um, Saul's family, from my understanding then, is like any number of upstanding families in our societies today. They may be wealthy, they may be socially connected, they may be good-hearted people, but not very religious and, and don't have as much for religion. Uh, I did some reading on that, and I wouldn't take this too far, but according to a Pew Research survey, belief in God is about 10% lower in households who earn more than $100,000 a year as compared to those households who make less than $30,000 a year. It's not to say that people of great wealth that make six figures or more don't believe in God, but it is to say they believe in God at a lower percentage than those who make less. Um, but despite his familial situation, however you want to see it, Saul was God's pick for the new king. The way that God brings about Saul's selection and his coronation and anointing is really providential. There's a series of unique events that befell Saul when he was, as we say, looking for lost donkeys of all things. I believe it was the very will of God that those donkeys go missing in the first place. Because I want you to see, secondly, God's providence for the king. God is going to orchestrate and bring about very interesting occurrences in this chapter. Notice one, Saul's problem. In verse 3, as we said, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to, his, to Saul, his son, take one of the young men with you. Again, they had some kind of servant. Uh, wealthy people. Take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find him. And they passed through the land of Shalaim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, in verse 5, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious for us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true, so let us now go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Saul doesn't even know who he's talking about. He's talking about Samuel. In verse 7 it says, Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? But the servant answered Saul again, Here I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, I love this little parenthetical verse in verse 9, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, it says that uh, when he went to inquire of God, he said, come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. So the text tells us, we say seer, it's talking about the prophet Samuel. And Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God, Samuel, was. Now, God orchestrates all of this. I believe God caused those donkeys to go missing in the first place. God can do some incredible things with animals, and you see that in Scripture. Whether that you see, you know, Balaam having a conversation with a donkey. Last night I went to the circus in Crowley, and I watched an elephant 
dance on one foot, you know. And animals can do some interesting things. And I think God uses them to bring Saul to where he needed to be, just so happened to be where Samuel was. And as you see, when he goes to this town, it's just it's almost the exact time that Samuel is walking through. It's by no means a coincidence. Notice in verse 11, this is that young woman I was alluding to. As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out, or women, I should say, coming out to draw water. And that, billet, that probably tells us it was around the evening, by the way. Uh, ladies in those days would go out in the early morning or in the evening to draw water. They met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer, is the prophet here? They answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Again, that's providential. Just so happened to be right behind Samuel. Hurry, he has come just now in verse 12 to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. He's here today. What are the odds? In verse 13, as soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now, go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, as they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Again, notice God's providence. Uh, verse 15, it says, The day before Samuel came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel, in verse 17, saw Saul, he knew God was bringing to fruition what he had promised. He says, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate, that's near the entrance of the city, and said, tell me, where is the house of the seer? <coughs> Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, this place of worship, by the way, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not send your, set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for, all, and for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? He's speaking so glowingly of Saul. He said, listen, I know why you're here. Don't worry about the donkeys. They've been found. And who's more important for me right now than you? It's very important I speak to you. I want you to come eat with me. We've got some things to discuss. And that's where Saul illustrates a pretty remarkable way of saying a very humble thing. He says, as we read earlier, am I not a Benjamite? Is not my clan the most humble? I want you to skip down to verse 25. We, we don't really have time to get into their meal. They share a meal. But in <laughs> verse 25, it says, When they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. At the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass along before us. And when he passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. I, I wanted to read all of that to you because it's nothing if not a, a plain demonstration of God's providence. That's why I say God's providence for the king. We see Saul's problem. He's missing donkeys. And I think that was God's idea. It's nothing out of the ordinary for God to make something come out of a donkey. And I'm not just talking about myself. I'm saying that because he made a donkey talk, literally. It almost makes me think of what the Lord told his disciples uh, just before the triumphal entry. Remember what he said? He said, go to so-and-so's house. You'll find a donkey tied with its colt. Go bring it to me. Tell them the Lord has need of it. God knows what's going on. And so much so, he makes known to Samuel, tomorrow, about this time, you're going to see somebody coming into town. You're going to recognize him. That's the guy. And Samuel just so happens that they meet in this way. It's remarkable how these things happen. And I don't know how much of it is coincidence in our world and how much of it is providence. Let me give you all an example. When I was in Houston three weekends ago, which is about four hours from here, give or take, I went to a Lutheran church in Houston, Texas to go and watch a debate. And it was, it was pretty, pretty great. We're sitting down. Me and my two friends, one from Louisiana, one from Florida, we're getting ready to watch this debate, and these people in front of us are talking, just as everyone in this church sanctuary is talking. And at one point, the people in front of us turn around and say, where are y'all from? Mm -hmm. They were from 
right around Lafayette, but they moved to Texas. They could tell by our accents, at least my Louisianian friend and us and me, where we were from. Here's, here's, here's where it gets weird. So it was an older woman, her husband, and their adult daughter who was about 35 years old. Now, the guy I'm with, he also has an adult daughter who's about 35 years old. His daughter is in Spain right now. Here's the weird thing. The people we just so happen to sit behind four hours from here, their daughter and his daughter were roommates in college, and they were getting together the next week in Spain. And we sat there going, what is God trying to tell us? And I listen, it might not, it, as uh, Ernest says in my family album, could be nothing. Could be nothing. But I think in many instances, it, not in my life, for sure in the lives of the, the pages of Scripture, God's providence is on display. He happens to orchestrate all of these seemingly insignificant and incidental things to bring about his purpose. Just so happens that Saul goes to all these different places. And at just this time, he goes down to this city. And at just that time, there's the prophet Samuel ready to meet him. And then Samuel says, right there in verse 27, Stop yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. So not only does Saul have a problem, what you're going to see in the next few verses, Saul is given a series of promises that I think are very trustworthy and true. Samuel says he's going to make known to Saul the word of God. And in a similar way, God is giving a Three-folded witness to Saul that he gave to someone like Moses. You remember when God calls Moses and says, you're going to go and rescue my, my people in Egypt. And Moses says, you got the wrong guy. Uh, they're not going to believe me. And God gives him three signs. He says, you can throw down your staff and it's become a snake. You can put your hand in your shirt and it's going to turn nasty, uh, leprous. Or you can take water from the Nile, pour it out, and it's going to become blood. There's your three signs. Well, in a similar sense... God's going to give Saul three different promises that demonstrate, yes, you are going to be my first king in Israel. And Saul says he's humble, right? He says, am I not a Benjamite? Am I not the lowliest of lowliest here? I want you to notice he was hesitant. He's humble. Again, in chapter 10, he was actually hiding when it came time for him to start wearing the crown. I want you to skip over now to verse 1 of chapter 10. Let's skip on ahead to chapter 10. In verse 1, this is where Saul is anointed. It says, Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? Can you imagine Saul hearing this? He has no idea what Samuel's about to tell him. You shall reign over the people of the Lord and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. First promise, when you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Which is interesting that Saul said something similar in the previous chapter. In verse 3, second sign, then you shall go on from there farther and come to the oak of Tabor. Apparently a very well-known tree. Three men are going up to God at Bethel. We'll meet you there. One carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that, you shall come to Gebeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. They're old enemies. And there, as soon as you come to the city... You will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will, be, you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. In verse 8 it says, Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you should do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And notice the end of verse 9. And all these signs came to pass that day. Samuel tells Saul that he is going to receive three promises. And I wanted to go a little bit further in this text, and we'll see what time we've got. But I want you to see those three things. First promise, he's going to meet some people, and that, well, he's going to meet a person, and that person's going to tell him, the donkeys are found, now your dad's worried about you. Second promise, you're going to meet some people going up to worship at Bethel, 
house of God, and they're going to give you bread. There might be some typology there. Third one is that you're going to meet a group of prophesying prophets. And that could both refer to speaking and singing. And they're going to have a bunch of instruments, so it's safe to say they were probably singing as well. You're going to just join in. And whatever you find to do, you do it because God is with you. Let me tell you what those three, prob what those three promises are meant to do. I think those promises are meant to cancel out Saul's problems. First promise, those donkeys are going to be found. You know what that tells me? That tells me that God can solve your problems. I think God is giving these promises to Saul to prepare him as king. And first thing you need to know as king, God can handle this. God can solve your problems. And that's a problem we can actually say about ourselves as well. Second promise that you would be given bread, God's going to provide what you need. Not only can he solve your problems, he can provide you what you need. He didn't have no bread now. It was out. That's right. <clears throat> Said he was out of food. That's a really good observation. And then the third one, that he is going to be gifted with the Holy Spirit God can empower him for service. I feel like I'm unworthy for this job. Am I not the humblest guy? God's spirit is going to rush upon you, and he's going to give you what you need to do what he needs you to do. Now, that verse right there where it says that Samuel was given another heart, a lot of scholars are hesitant to say that that means he was regenerated, that he was saved, that he was, you know, given new life, uh, only because of what he does later. And to say that the Holy Spirit cannot, be fall, uh, cannot fall on or be... Uh, make use of lost souls is wrong. Uh, I personally don't think that the high priest that sought to have Jesus crucified, for example, Caiaphas, I wouldn't really consider Caiaphas to be a saved believer, the one that literally had cru Jesus crucified. Yet the Gospel of John tells us in John 11 that Caiaphas actually prophesied under the power of the Spirit of God. And I wouldn't say Caiaphas is saved. So I say that to say that there's a lot of people who have their doubts about the salvation of King Saul. Uh, it says he was given a new heart. A lot of people would take that to mean he was given a new sense in what he was called to do. Not necessarily that he was saved. Well, that's that's... I was going to say that there is a sense of one of a little more courage because, like you said, he was very in and in whatever, so it could have been more of a. Right. My Bible says he was a changed man. That's a better way. That might be a better way of understanding yeah. it. So. I think that's some pretty great promises, though. God can solve your problems. God can supply your needs. God can give you power with the Holy Spirit. That applies to every believer. And then notice, thirdly, God's plan for the king. Verse 1 tells us what God's after with this king, the one that would reign in Israel. He is anointed, and Samuel says, You shall reign over the people of the Lord. You will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And all these things, I would say, Saul was also getting people ready for the reign of David. Called him Prince. Mm -hmm. That's it's a remarkable way of. And those of us who know Genesis 49 and the fact that the true king is going to come from Judah know that a Benjamite was never meant to set up any kind of dynasty. Saul was never meant to be the the one that would set up a long line of descendants. In fact, I believe God always personally, I really always believe God had in mind David. But when the people asked for a king, as we said last week, David. Either he wasn't even born or he was just a little boy. Wasn't even close to being ready for king. Um, but the last thing I want to leave y'all with, with what few minutes we have, and praise God we're going to be able to go through this. I don't think you could make an entire, well, I suppose you could, an entire Bible study out of this. But could we go a bit further? Is there not something more to the Theonustos written word of God that we have just heard? Uh, this is not my words that we study. This is God's words. I think there's even more to learn from this story. And I confess that I had found this through some studying and some research in this couple of chapters of 1 Samuel. But I think we see God's pick in Saul. I think we see God's providence for Saul. And I think we see God's plan for Saul, the new king. But I think we also see God's prefiguring of the true king. And I don't mean David. Let me show you what I mean. God's prefiguring of the true king. So number one, God's king is divinely empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, and when we think about how this might apply to Jesus, I think about what the Bible says in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Do you know what the word Christ actually means? It, it comes back to the word Messiah. And Messiah means anointed one. 
uh, when we say Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he is the, the anointed one. And we think about how Jesus himself may have gone through a physical anointing, by who? John the Baptist. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, John didn't even want to do it, and Jesus said, no, you need to do this, for it's so fitting now to fulfill all righteousness. And it says the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. God's king is divinely empowered. And I think we see that with Jesus. I think we see that later with David. Um, but not only that, God's king is not only divinely empowered. God's king is different. The anointed one will be different from all the other people in Israel. Now, Saul was different because he was tall and he was handsome. And by the way, when it says he was tall, I don't think he was like, you know, six foot six. Right? Y'all ever been to museums of primitive peoples or older? Even just go to a Civil War museum. Most people are stunned when they realize how short some people are. Okay? Like, people like to pick on Napoleon for being short. Napoleon was about my height. Maybe a few inches shorter, but... People back then didn't eat gene genetically modified foods and all the other things we eat, especially in Louisiana. Uh, but to say he was tall, I'm not saying he was short, but I am saying that, by comparison, he wasn't as relatively uh, big as a lot of our people are today. But the way Jesus is different is so much more significant than his stature. In fact, his stature is by no means the significant part of his difference. He wasn't like the Well, yeah, but I mean, Isaiah says that Jesus had no form or majesty that we should admire him. What sets Jesus apart is his divinity and his sinlessness. God's king is divinely empowered. He's different, but sadly, God's king is despised. There were some people who weren't satisfied with Saul as their king. Look at verse 27 of chapter 10, if you've still got your Bible. He says, some worthless fellow said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. This is after he was publicly proclaimed to be the king. It sounds like somebody else I know, another king. Isaiah 53, 3 says that Jesus was despised and rejected. And Jesus himself, like Saul in this passage, did not take that as liberty or opportunity to call down the thunder on his, you know, denouncers. Jesus hanging on the cross had every ability and every authority under heaven to come down off of it as they were tempting him to do. But Peter says, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And that's more or less what Saul does. The Bible doesn't say that Saul took offense at that and started smack talking back. But not only is God's king divinely empowered and different and sadly despised, we see more than anything that God's king is delivering God's purpose in the king is to restrain the wickedness of the people and return their hearts back to God, more or less. And that's a rather apt summary of what the Lord Jesus does. Um, so begins the time of the kings. And I have to tell you all, when you read chapter 11, chapter 12, uh, and especially when Saul begins reigning, God's not going to let go, or rather Samuel's not going to let go without a rather interesting exit. Uh, you want to talk about calling down thunder from heaven. Keep reading. Saul begins with a lot of success, but by some people's summary, uh, he kind of goes from hero to zero. The book of 1 Samuel ends with Saul's untimely death, and there's a debate whether or not he killed himself or he was killed by the Amalekite who claimed to kill him in 2 Samuel 1, but there is going to be another anointed of God that we're going to read about soon who teaches us a great more deal about God and the Lord Jesus because Jesus is David's heir. But to recap, there's plenty of lessons to be seen here. We saw that God can solve problems. God can supply the things that we need. And we see that God can spiritually empower us for service. And I love the image of King Saul being anointed because I associate the anointing with our baptism. That's where we are anointed. And I think we see a lot here about the Lord Jesus, how he is also divinely empowered because he is divine. How he is different, how he's despised, but ultimately how he delivers. Uh... And as I said, thus begins the time of the kings. So you can go home, read in chapter 11. You'll see Saul has a lot of success fighting against Israel's enemies. You see the kingdom renewed. You see Samuel's farewell address in chapter 12, and so on it goes. Uh, but it doesn't take very long. In fact, by chapter 13, Samuel gets a little too, excuse me, Saul gets a little too big for his britches, and uh, he tries to take Samuel's job to an extent. But we'll come back to that later. Is there anything y'all would like to add to this before we wrap up? Verse 26. That's right. And look at that 26. Saul also went to. 
Uh, That's true. Saul also went to his home at Gebeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah. Take it from a history teacher. As much as times seem to change a lot of ways, people don't. People back then are people. And it's just as much as our politicians give us reasons to complain, whine, moan, and look to God and say, come Lord Jesus, Saul's going to have plenty of faults as well. As we'll see when we return. Thank you for your attention tonight.